evening, everyone. Uh, so my topic for presentation today is basics of ECG for perioperative monitoring. I would rather like to share my screen. So first we'll start with the components of the ECG. So the P wave, P wave uh, is the atrial depolarization wave and the duration is 0 0.08 to 0 0.1 second. The QRS complex is the due to the ventricular depolarization and the duration is 0 0.06 to 0 0.1 second. The T wave represents the ventricular repolarization duration of which is 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 seconds. The PR interval starts from the start of the P wave to the start of the QRS and the duration is 0 0.12 to 0 0.2 seconds. The QT starts from the start of the Q to the end of the T, duration 0 0.4 to 0 0.44 seconds. The RR interval is the interval between the two consecutive RR of the QRS complexes and the duration is 0 0.6 to 0.2 seconds. The J point is the junction of the QRS complex segment and the S2 segment starts at the J point and ends at the start of the T wave. Therefore, it is a junction of the ventricular depolarization and the ventricular repolarization. So this shows a normal ECG with PQRS T waves. Uh, here we can see the small square and you have to know that the length of the small square is one millimeter and the duration is 0 0.04 second. And the uh, large square, the width of which comprises of five small squares, the duration will be 0 0.04 into five, that is 0 0.2 seconds. So this is the magnified view of the PQRST. This is the PR interval. This is the J point. So it's a junction of the QRS and the ST segment. And the ST segment starts at the J point and ends at the start of the T wave. These are the PR intervals, RR intervals, and the QT intervals is already discussed. And now we're coming to the conduction of the uh, cardiac conduction. The starts at the SA node. And after activating both the atria, it comes to the AV node from where the bundle of phase arises. And then it divides into the right and the left bundles. And then through the Purkinje fibers, it activates the ventricular myocardium. So the PR interval actually represents the time between the depolarization of the atria to the depolarization of the ventricle. This whole time represents the PR interval. So how do we go about with the ECG? How do we read it? So the first step is to see the rhythm, then the rate, then the conduction, uh, then identifying the heart axis, and then the morphologies of the P wave, the QRS complex, and the ST segments. And if you have a previous ECG, you can compare the current ECG with the previous one, and then you conclude the ECG. So how do we find the rhythm? First, you have to know whether it's a sinus rhythm for that, every QRS has to be preceded by a normal P wave and uh, the rhythm should be regular when the RR intervals are equal. So once you have confirmed the rhythm, you then go to the rate. You have to count the number of the large squares between the RR interval and then 300 is divided by the number of large squares uh, between the RR interval to find out the rate. The conduction is in interpreted by the durations of the PR, the QRS and the QT. The axis, the normal axis of the heart is from the minus 30 to plus 90 degrees. And you calculate it by taking into account two perpendicular leads. One is the uh, lead one and other is the lead AVF. The lead one is from zero to 180 degree. And the AVF is from 90 to minus 90 degree. Now, what you need to see is that which way the predominant deflection in the ECG is, whether it is positive or whether it is negative. If the predominant deflection is positive on lead one, also it is positive on lead ABA, that means the resulting vector will be in this quadrant and therefore it will be a normal axis. Now, if the lead one is positive and the ABA is negative, then of course the vector will be in this quadrant, which signifies a left axis deviation. And in case when the AVF will be positive and lead one will be negative, it will be a right axis deviation. So this way we can find out 
the axis of the heart. The next step is to see the morphology. So the P wave morphology is seen best in V2. Here it should be upright and in V1 it is biphasic. So you have to note any kind of change in the morphology, whether the P wave is hidden, whether it is retrograde, whether it is peaked. Uh, peak P wave you find in right atrial enlargement like P pulmonal and in left atrial enlargement you can get notch P wave that is P mitral. The QRS you note for the QRS duration, the RS ratio and the morphology and the ST segment you have to see the whether it is isoelectric, whether it is elevated or whether it is depressed. Then you, if, if you have a previous ECG, you compare it to find out if there is a new ECG change and then you complete, uh, conclude the ECG like, uh, for example, this ECG shows, uh, it, uh, shows a sinus tachycardia with a ST elevation and which may be due to a myocardial infection, infarction. This is how you conclude an ECG. Now coming to the causes of the axis deviation. Now left axis deviation is due to the inferior wall myocardial inf infarction. Why it happens? Because the QRS vector will be deviated from the area of the necrosis upward and towards the left side. Therefore, in inferior wall MI, we get a left axis deviation. Other causes are left ventricle hypertrophy and left anterior hemiblock. Right axis deviation we get in case of anterior uh, wall myocardial inf infarction, where the QRS vector will be deviated from the area of the necrosis inferiorly and to the right and also in case of right ventricle hypertrophy and left posterior hemiblock. So let me explain this. Coming back to the axis, if you draw the heart on this, this will be the inferior surface of the heart, here will be the apex and this will be the anterolateral part of the heart. So if there is an inferior infarct, the axis will move away from this area towards this area. Therefore, in inferior infarct, you will have a left axis deviation. Similarly, in an anterior infarct, the axis will now move away from that area of necrosis rightward. So you will have a right axis deviation. Now, next, obviously, in case of left ventricle hypertrophy, the axis will be deviated to that side. And in right ventricle hypertrophy, the axis will be deviated to this side. Now, in case of left anterior and posterior hemiblock, see the uh, left fascicle, left bundle, when it comes, it divides into two fascicles, the left anterior and the left posterior. The left anterior comes down inferiorly and towards the right, and left posterior uh, goes posteriorly and towards the left. So when the left anterior uh, fascicle is blocked, the impulse will go through the posterior fascicle superiorly and towards the left side and therefore there will be a left axis deviation and when there is left posterior hemiblock the impulse will come through the left anterior fascicle inferiorly and towards the right and therefore there will be a right axis deviation. So that explains why we get this left and right axis deviation in these conditions. Now, uh, something to talk about the genesis of the QRS. Now, for a ventricular depolarization to occur, the initial small vector is always from the left to the right through the interventricular septum. And this will be followed by a larger vector from the right to the left side through the free wall of the myocardium. So this is the normal physiology what happens. Now, what effect will be it will have on the left-oriented leads and the right-oriented leads? Now, for the left-oriented leads, when the vector is going from the left to right, that means it is going away from that lead. So there will be a negative deflection in AVL, V5 and V6. And since the vector is a small vector, therefore it will manifest as a small Q wave, a small negative deflection. And then the larger vector will be from the right to the left. That means it is coming towards the left-sided leads. And since it is a larger vector, it will be represented by a large R wave, positive deflection and large R. So in all left-sided leads, normally we get a QR pattern. For the right-sided leads like V1 and V2, what we get is a RS pattern. Why? Because again, it is uh, firstly the impulse comes from the left towards the right. That means it is towards the right-sided leads, but the vector is small. Therefore, it is a small R. And then again, it goes away from the right-sided leads towards the left-sided leads. 
therefore there will be a negative deflection and since the vector vector is large it will be a greater deflection so it will be a rs pattern so for all left sided leads there will be a qr pattern and for all right sided leads it will be a rs pattern now coming to the criteria of ventricular hypertrophy criteria for left ventricular hypertrophy is r wave in avl greater than 11 mm and this is the modified pronal criteria the other criteria is the summation of s wave in v1 and the r wave in either v5 or v6 if it is greater than 35 mm then it again satisfy the criteria of left ventricular hypertrophy and this is the sotlo leon criteria now the right ventricular hypertrophy here the rs ratio in v1 should be greater than 1 but for that you have to eliminate other causes where this can be greater than 1 like in posterior wall myocardial infarction and in right bundle branch block so in the absence of posterior wall mi and rbb rs ratio greater than 1 in v1 will signify right ventricular hypertrophy and the second condition is when the r wave in v1 is greater than 7 mm now coming to the intraventricular conduction defects now rbbb what will happen it will have a rs r dash in v1 v2 why rs r dash because since the left bundle is conducting normally so i already told that in the right sided lead there will be an rs pattern so this part is normal now because the right ventricle depolarization is getting delayed than the left ventricle this r dash will occur so r dash is because of the delayed rv depolarization and the qrs will be more than 0.12 seconds in case of complete rvb if it's incomplete rvb the duration will be from 0.11 to 0.12 seconds in lvb we get a m pattern in v5 v6 with disappearance of the q wave i already told you that in left sided lead presence of q wave is normal so when there will be lbb the first thing is to there will be disappearance of the q wave and this m pattern is because there will be sequential depolarization of the ventricle because here now the right ventricle will be first depolarized then the left ventricle and because of the sequential depolarization there will be two peaks and a m pattern again the qrs will be more than 0.12 incomplete and in incomplete it will be between 0.11 and 0.12 seconds now left anterior hemi block i explain why there should be a left axis deviation and since the impulse is going through the posterior fascicle towards the left side obviously then there will be a tall r wave in the lateral leads and since it's going away from the inferior leads there will be deep s wave in the inferior leads in left posterior hemi block again I have explained why there is right axis deviation. The opposite will occur. The deep S wave in lateral leads and tall R in the inferior leads because now the impulse impulse through the anterior fascicle is going towards the inferior leads. Now this is a ECG of a 45 year old woman who is asymptomatic. So what are the steps of reading an ECG? First, I told that you have to understand the rhythm. So here, first we'll see whether it's a sinus rhythm or not. So in all the uh before the qrs there are p wave so all the qrs are preceded by a p wave there that means and this p wave is a normal p wave i don't find any abnormality in this p wave because c lead 2 it is upright v1 it is biphasic and the rr intervals are regular so it's a normal sinus rhythm and all the p q r s morphology are normal the p r interval are normal so this is a case of a normal ecg with a heart rate of 60 because if you count 1 2 3 4 5 there are five large squares between the rr so 300 by 5 is 60 so with the heart rate of 60 it's a sinus rhythm and a normal ecg from now on i'll be only pointing out the valid points of the uh, diagnostic points on the ecg and i'll not go through the whole ecg so what uh, we find in this ecg which is most significant see the pr interval is prolonged in every lead the pr interval is prolonged so 
the PR interval 0.2 is one big square. So it is more than that. And the normal PR interval is 0.12 to 0.2 seconds. Here the PR interval is 0.32 seconds. So its diagnosis is a first degree AV block. Next is a 86 year old woman complaining of generalized weakness. What do we find here? We find again a prolongation of pre wave. Next, the prolongation has increased. It is more increased, and this is followed by a drop beat. So, what is this? This is a second degree AV block, Mobis type 1 or the Vankybax phenomena. But here, there are other features as well. I can see an R dash pattern in V1. Therefore, there is associated RBEV. And a criteria for left ventricular hypertrophy has been fulfilled because the AVL is greater than 11 millimeter. So it's a second degree heart block type 1 with left ventricular hypertrophy and RBD. Uh, and see, the, in spite of having a RBD, this ECG has a left axis deviation because of the left ventricular hypertrophy. Now, the next is the 85 year old woman presenting after syncopal episode and still reports lightheadedness. What, what do we see in this ECG? I can see P, QRST, P, no QRS complex here. Here also P, no QRS complex. Here also P, no QRS complex. So there has been non conductance of the P wave intermittently, and this is followed by a drop beat. And also, I can see a LBBB pattern. See, the QRS is prolonged in duration. And there is a M pattern in V5, V6, which I was talking about. So this ECG is a second degree AV block Mobis type 2 with a LBBB. Now, what is the difference between Mobis type 1 and Mobis type 2? Mobis type 2 will also have intermittent non-conductance of T-wave. But here in Mobis type 2, the PR interval will be constant in those beats that are conducted. In contrary to Mobis type 1, where there is a gradual prolongation of the P wave, PR interval. Next, this ECG shows a complete AV dissociation. I cannot find any relationship between the P and the QRS complexes. So it's a third degree heart block. So uh, it's AV dissociation. Ventricular rhythm can be the nodal, can be idioventricular, or maybe absent. And this will need a temporary pacemaker. So we come to the pacemakers which are needed in these types of scenarios. So the North American Society of Pacing and the British Pacing Electrophysiology Group have uh, made some code for the identification of the pacemakers. And it relies on five letters. And each letter represents something. Letter one is the chamber paste. Letter two is the chamber sense. Letter three is the mode of response. Letter four is the programmability of the rate modulation. And letter five is the anti tachycardia function. Now, according to the chamber paste, it can be either none, it can be atria, ventricular dual, similar for the sensing. And mode of response can be none, can be triggered, can be inhibited, or can be dual. Programmability can be none, can be single programmable, can be multi programmable, can be communicating, can be rate responsive either to wind ventilation or movement. And anti tachycardia function can be none, can be pacing, can be shock, can be dual. So, from this knowledge, you can very well understand what type of pacemaker this is AAO. So, here atrial uh, pacing, atrial sensing, mode of response is none. Here, similarly, the mode of response here it is inhibited. This is a ventricular pacing VVI mode and this is a dual chamber pacing and this is a dual chamber pacemaker with a rate responsive function. So we come to the ECG showing some pacing complexes. You can see pacing complexes before all the QRS complexes and a very important thing to note is that all the STT waves are discordant to the QRS. So what is the meaning of that? Now, this ECG shows a ventricular pacing with 100% capture and the STT waves are appropriately discordant. And this is similarly what happens in case of LBEB. And this is very diagnostic of LBEB and also in case of ventricular pacing. Next is 
61 year old man history of syncope uh, but uh, now asymptomatic why asymptomatic because you can see there are two pacing spikes here the initial pacing spike is followed by atrial complex and then there's another pacing spike which is followed by a qrs complex so it's av sequential pacemaker again it looks about a hundred percent capture because after every pacing there is a complex of atrial or the ventricular and again you find that lb type of morphology with stt wave discordance and what is this stt discordance it means that when the qrs is positive the stt will be negative and in leads where the qrs is negative the stt will be positive this is one of the indicators of ventricular pacing and also in cases of left bundle branch block so how do we minimize the risk of the intraoperative interference from the electrocardiogram system so position the cotton tool and the current treatment pad so that the current pathway does not pass through or near the pacemaker system avoiding proximity of the cotton's electrical field to the pulse generator and the leads using short intermittent irregular bursts at the lowest feasible energy level and using bipolar electrocautery system or ultrasonic harmonic scalpel if possible next we come to the blood supply of the heart because uh, this is very important because uh, you will understand when which artery is blocked which part of myocardium will be affected so the right coronary supplies the right atrium the right ventricle and the inferior wall of the left ventricle the sa node in 60% case av node in 90% case and also give rise to the pda uh, in 85% cases which supplies the posterior interventricular septum so right coronary occlusion will lead to either rv or inferior wall infarct and in all these infarct it is very common to find ad block because in 90% cases the supply comes through this right coronary artery now the left cor coronary artery it is the two branches of the left anterior descending and left circumflex the left anterior descending supplies the anterior interventricular septum and the anterior, uh, anterior wall and the sarc supplies the lateral wall now in cases of left dominance left dominant circulation it is only occurs in 15% of cases the pda will rise from the sarc there is a reason of telling this we we'll come to know uh, now the led branches are the diagonals and the septals and the sarc branches are the obtuse marginal and posterior lateral so how do we localize the leads uh, the septal is v1 v2 anterior wall is v3 v4 lateral wall is v5 v6 v1 and avl inferior wall is 2 3 avf posterior wall is v7 to v9 and right ventricle is represented by the right sided lead v3r to v6r in a normal ecg we don't get the v7 to v9 and the right sided leads but in a normal ecg we can still get a reflection of the posterior wall changes as a reciprocal changes in the anterior wall v1 to v4 now when there is a subendocardial injury to the heart there is always a st depression and why this occurs because the st vector is now directed towards the cavity and away from the chest leads so since it is away it has to be a negative deflection and so therefore it is a st depression on the contrary when the transmural injury occurs it is always st elevation because now the st vector will be directed towards the muscle which is uh, directing towards the leads so there will be an st elevation so what happens when after the injury infarction occurs that is the actual muscle necrosis occurs so the diagnosis will depend on the presence of the q waves because this why this occurs because if the electrical hole is created because of the formation of the scar tissue and the loss of rv amplitude because of the loss of the muscle or the myocardium and therefore a transmural infarct will have a qs pattern but if there is some somewhat viable overlying myocardium remaining it will have a qr pattern the small r will signify that part of the overlying myocardium which is viable but all kinds of infarct doesn't have a q wave and those are the subendocardial non q non stemi infarct where usually we get a st depression so how a stemi uh, infarct evolution take place in the hyperacute phase usually we get st elevation with dalti in the evolved phase, we get a Q wave with T inversion. In the stabilized phase, we get 
the Q wave and the T inversion is written back to the normal. So already we discussed the blood supply of the heart. You can see the left coronary artery dividing with the LAD and the SAR. And there's a right coronary artery going below as the PDA. Now this is important because uh, at the level of the blockage of the arteries, the zones of the infarct will be uh, obvious to you. See, if the LAD is blocked out here, what this part of the myocardium will be gone. And this part of myocardium is the anteroceptal area which it actually supplies. Now, this is the diagonal branch. If only the diagonal branch is blocked, if the infarct occurs in this area, it will have an anterosuperior infarct. And this is the SARD branch with a branch of this is the postural lateral branch of the left circumflex artery. When this is blocked, it will cause a postural lateral infarct. In all cases of inferior infarct, it is due to the blockage of the, either the right coronary artery, right coronary artery, or the PDA, which in 85% cases will arise from the right coronary artery. But you have to remember some minority cases like in 15 percent cases where the pda arises from the sar and in some cases of congenital variation where the led is wrapped around the apex of the heart to supply the inferior wall in those cases the inferior infarct can also be due to the affection of the left territory so what are the chest leads uh, for the lateral it is one avl and v5 v6 the anteroceptal is V1 to V4 and inferior is 2, 3 and AVF. Now coming to the ECGs, 46 year old man with chest and left arm pain, vomiting and diaphoresis. What we find here is T inversions, 1, 2, 3, AVF and also in V2, V3, V4, V5, V6, all are T inversions and this is Consistent with T-wave abnormality with inferior and anterolateral in ischemia. See, this is inferior and lateral and anterior. So it's a inferior with anterolateral ischemia. And you have, you have to note there are two other things as well. The QT interval is prolonged. And this is because of the myocardial ischemia. And another thing is there is a poor progression of the R wave. How it is defined? Poor progression of the R wave is defined by the R wave amplitude or in V3 less than 3 millimeter. If you see the V3, the R wave amplitude is less than 3 millimeter. And this is one of the definitions of the poor progression of R wave. And what, what does it suggest? It usually suggests a previous anteroceptal MI, but it may be also be due to left ventricular hypertrophy or abnormally high placement of the precordial chest leads. So, uh, but it is not diagnostic for anteroceptal MI, it is a, just a suggestion. So you have to rule out other causes as well. Now, next ECG is a 54 year old woman complaining of mid sternal chest pain and lightheadedness. See, there are ST elevation in 1 AVL and V2 to V4 with ST depression in inferior leads. So basically, it's an acute anterior and lateral myocardial infarction. Anterior and one AVA, lateral myocardial infarction. And there is an AV junction rhythm because here the PR interval is also shortened. You see the PR interval is shortened. It is less than 0.12. But the most important finding of this ECG is that there is a reciprocal ST segment depression present in the inferior leads. This presence of the reciprocal change significantly increases the specificity of the ST segment elevation for acute MI. Because in many other cases, you can get ST segment elevation or depression, but it has to be corroborated by a reciprocal change. When there is a MI, there has to be a reciprocal change in other leads so as to diagnose that the elevation is due to the myocardial infarction. 57 year old man with chest pain and diaphoresis. What do we find here? See, there is ST elevation in 2, 3 AVF and also in V5, V6. And also there is depression in V1 to V4. These are very interesting ECG because from the ECG, we can see that this is a inferolateral infarct, inferior and V5, V6 lateral. But there 
are two more possible possibilities in this ecg the st elevation in lead 3 is much more than in lead 2 and lead 3 is a more right sided lead that points to a diagnosis of right ventricular infarct and also i can see that v1 and v2 where the r wave is usually small here it is quite big with there is st depression from v1 to v4 which is seen as a reciprocal change of the posterior wall in the anterior wall and this gives a suggestion of a posterior wall myocardial infarction so see they have told that the st segment in lead 3 uh, since it is uh, more pronounced than in lead 2 there can be a coexistent right ventricular infarction so how do you confirm you have in these cases you have to take a right sided lead v3 to v6 right v3r to v uh, v6r you have to take to confirm the diagnosis of a right ventricular infarct and for the posterior uh, in fact uh, because there is r waves in v1 to v3 and st depression from v1 to uh, v3 in the anterior leads as a reciprocal change of uh, of the posterior wall so you have to see the v7 to v9 to confirm the diagnosis of a posterior infarct now interpreting the heart rhythm so first you have to see what is the ventricular heart rate if the heart rate is above 100 it is tachycardia if it is less than 60 it is bradycardia we have to see if there are any extra systoles atrial or ventricular next as i told you to see the p waves in lead 2 and v1 and then to find the rate of the p wave the morphology of the p wave is there any one is to one relation between the p and the qrs if not then there is a chance of av dissociation and this may be due to a av block or a ventricular arrhythmia so you have to see whether every p wave is followed by a qrs or every qrs is preceded by a p and you have to note the pr interval and you have to see whether it is changing now coming to the qrs if the width is less than 120 milliseconds it's narrow complex so the differential diagnosis may be a sinus arrhythmia supraventricular rhythm junctional rhythm and if it is more than 120 milliseconds which is broad complex it can be ventricular rhythm it can be supraventricular rhythm with an additional bundle branch block so what are the differential diagnosis of a narrow complex tachycardia so if the narrow complex tachycardia is regular the differential diagnosis is a sinus tachycardia atrial flutter paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia which may be due to a uh, av nodal reentrant tachycardia or av reciprocating tachycardia which needs access in pathway or it can be a simple atrial tachycardia because of a focus in the atrium other than the sm node next if it is irregular if it is irregular it can be due to atrial fibrillation it can be due to atrial flutter with variable av block or at least it can be due to the multifocal atrial tachycardia where there are multiple focus in the atria generating ectopic impulse now coming to the atrial rates in sin uh, sinus tachycardia the atrial rate will be the same as the ventricular rate uh, because most of the impulse will be conducted uh, but the less uh, heart rate will be less than 200 per minute in case of psvt the atrial rate will be between 150 to 250 in atrial flutter it will be even higher 250 to 400 in atrial fibrillation it will be 400 to 600 and therefore you can imagine that all the uh, impulses will not be conducted because of the refractiveness of the av node and therefore the ventricular rate will be variable now what are the differential diagnosis of broad complex tachycardia if it is regular it is monomorphic ventricular tachycardia or it can be svt with the aberrant conduction if it is irregular it is a polymorphic ventricular tachycardia where is varying qrs morphology and amplitude or it may be torsor is pointers Where, where there is a polymorphic ventricular tachycardia with a prolonged QT interval and a twisting QRS complex. So, how can we differentiate between a ventricular tachycardia and a SVT with aberrancy? So, the points in favor of ventricular tachycardia are absence of the typical RBV and LBV and the presence of AV dissociation. I think these are the two most important points which you have to see to rule out. Uh, whether it is svt or not other points which are less common is that extreme axis deviation whether qrs is positive in avr it actually doesn't happen or in 
uh, one in ABA, it is the QRS will be negative. There will be a positive or negative concordance from V1 to V6. That means when you're going from V1 to V6, either it will be entirely positive R or negative QS complexes with no RS transition. There can be fusion beads like sinus and ventricular bead can coincide to produce a hybrid bead. But I think the most two important points to remember is that whether you find RBB or LBB or whether there is presence or absence of AV dissociation. So the arrhythmias, uh, supraventricular can be atrial or nodal, and then the ventricular arrhythmias. So these are the types of supraventricular arrhythmias, as I discussed, atrial fibrillation, AV nodal, atrial tachycardia, atrial tachycardia, atrial flutter, and all those. So we come into the next ECG, is a 24-year-old pregnant woman with three days of frequent vomiting. So what do we find? So it's a narrow complex tachycardia, first thing, and it is regular. And a rate is around 150. And I can see the P, Q, R, S, T, everything is normal. There is the relationship, one is to one relationship between the P and Q, R, S. So it is a sinus tachycardia, though the differential diagnosis of a narrow complex regular tachycardia will be sinus tachycardia, SVT, and atrial flutter. But since we find here a one is to one relationship between the P waves and QRS. It confirms the diagnosis of the sinus tachycardia. Next is a 61 year old man with palpitation and lightheadedness. So, what do we find? It's a sheer shot broad complex tachycardia with a, a regular rate and again a rate of around 150. So, what do we see? It's a wide complex tachycardia. Differential diagnosis can be sinus tachycardia with aberrant conduction, supraventricular tachycardia with aberrant conduction, or a ventricular tachycardia. So, as I told you, first you have to see whether there is any kind of RBB or LBB. So, I don't find any features of RBB and LBB here. So, and number two, I can find the presence of uh, AV dissociation. The P waves are intermittently seen in V1 and D2. See, I can see the P wave here, V1 and V2, and also in D2. So these are the P waves, and there is no association between the P and the QRS. So there's a clear cut case of AV dissociation with absence of LBB, RBB. So this goes in favor of a ventricular tachycardia. So next ECG is 40-year-old man with palpitation and lightheadedness. What do we find here? It's a narrow complex tachycardia, which is regular. And I cannot find the P waves. The P waves are either hidden or abnormal. And sometimes I find retrograde P waves here. So it's a narrow complex tachycardia. What are the differential diagnosis? The sinus tachycardia, SVD, and atrial flutter. So you have to see the atrial activity. In this case, there is no one is to one relationship, so sinus tachycardia is ruled out. I cannot see any atrial flutter waves in the inferior leads, but I can see retrograde P waves, so there is a clear cut case of supraventricular tachycardia. 81 year old woman with palpitation and generalized weakness. What do you find here? I can see that the, all the RR intervals are irregular. So it's a narrow complex tachycardia and irregular. So what will be the differential diagnosis? Narrow complex tachycardia, irregular tachycardia, atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter with a variable AV conduction, and a multifocal atrial tachycardia. So again, we have to go for a close evaluation of the atrial activity. So for the atrial activity, it will be associated with a regular atrial activity, that is the flutter waves. In case of multiple atrial tachycardia, uh, there will be irregular atrial activity with atrial complex of varying morphology. But in, in this, this ECG, we do not find any atrial complex at all. So no P waves. So therefore, it is atrial fibrillation. It will not be associated with any notable atrial complex at all. Next is a 63-year-old man with palpitation and lightheadedness. So here it is again a narrow complex tachycardia. But... What we find here is the flutter waves are seen in the inferior leads like a sort with the appearance. And I can see two P waves followed by a QRS. So the P2P rate is around 300 and R2R, this is a ventricular rate, is around 150. So it's a 2 is to 1 hard block. 
So narrow complex tachycardia, differential diagnosis, regular is again uh, sinus tachycardia, SVT and atrial flutter. So here we do find the atrial flutter waves in the inferior leads and the atrial complex is inverted and manifests as a sorted pattern. So this is a case of atrial flutter. Next is a ECG, which is again an narrow complex tachycardia, but now the RR intervals are irregular. So it's an irregular narrow complex tachycardia. So again, what are the differential diagnoses? It will be atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter with variable block and multifocal atrial tachycardia. But here we do find P waves. So atrial fibrillation is ruled out. Multifocal atrial tachycardia is ruled out because uh, the P waves are morphologically similar and not dissimilar. But the only difference is that here I can find three P waves followed by QRS. Here I can find four P waves followed by QRS. And here I can find two P waves followed by QRS. So all kinds of blocks are prevailing. So it's an atrial flutter with a variable heart block. This is a very classical ECG. Uh, you can see the uh, PR interval is uh, shortened. There is up, a slurring of the upstroke of the QRS with a broadened QRS. Though I don't see any tachycardia, but these patients are prone to paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia, and the diagnosis is straight cut, full Parkinson White syndrome with a short PR interval less than 0.2, prolongation of the QRS complex, and a slurred upstroke of the QRS, which is called the delta wave. Now, there are certain morphological differences also. Uh, between the SVT and the VT uh, in a wide complex tachycardia, which you should also see to uh, differentiate. Because when you see in V1 and V2, in ventricular tachycardia, this R wave will be much broader than in SVT, which is much narrower. In the down slope, there will be a notch or slur in case of ventricular tachycardia. In SVT, the, the downstroke will be sleek and quick. And in V6, what we find in ventricular tachycardia, this is a normal uh, thing we find that is the presence of the Q wave. But in SVT, since it is associated with the LBEB, we do not find any Q wave. And again, I find this L, uh, M pattern which confirms the diagnosis of LBEB. And therefore, this is SVT with the aberrant conduction. This is another way you can rule out between SVT with the aberrant conduction and a ventricular tachycardia. This is a classical uh, ECG of ventricular fibrillation, totally chaotic rhythm, no, no P, QRS, nothing is discernible. And this is also a very classical ECG where you find the R on T phenomena going into a polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. Why polymorphic? Because the, all the QRS is amplitude and the morphologies are different. So this is a polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. So what it means is a defibrillation. It's a delivery of current to the chest, to the heart, to depolarize the myocardial cell and eliminate the ventricular fibrillation. So the, what are the indications? Structural rhythm or ventricular fibrillation and pulseless ventricular tachycardia. Uh, if, if you use a, bifa a biphasic defib, the initial joule is 120 followed by 150 and 200. For monophasic defib, it is 200, then 300 and then 360. So in biphasic, the current goes to the positive parallel and again reverses and goes back, which increases success rate to 90% as compared with monophasic, where the success rate is only 60%. Now, some more interesting ECGs. A 33-year-old obese man with sharp chest pain and dyspnea. So what do we find? First thing, if you see lead 1 and AVF, AVF is predominantly positive, and lead 1 is predominantly negative. So it's a right axis deviation. And next is we find T inversion in the inferior and the anterior leads and also a deep S wave in lead 1 and Q and T inversion and lead 3. All these changes goes to a classical diagnosis of acute pulmonary embolism where you get the classic S1, Q3, T3 finding that is a large S wave in lead 1, small Q wave in lead 3 and inverted T in lead 3 associated with anterior inferior ischemia with the rightward axis. So this is acute pulmonary embolism. Next is a 52-year-old post-op scoliosis surgery patient, greater than six hours surgery with two liters blood loss and hypertensive in the ICU. What is the main finding you get here? See, I can get 
uh, positive deflection at the terminal end of the, all the QRSS complexes. And what does that mean? They are the J waves or the Osborne waves, and they are found in cases of hypothermia. The exact cause of the J wave in hypothermia patient is unknown, but they are highly sensitive and specific for hypothermia. With this, you can get an associated prolongation of the QRS and the QT intervals. So you hear the QRS and the QT intervals are also prolonged. So whenever you get G J waves with prolongation of the QRS and QT, the always the diagnosis will be hypothermia, but you have to rule out other causes of prolonged QT interval like hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, hypocalcemia, acute myocardial ischemia, elevated intracranial pressure, and drugs with sodium channel blocking effects like tricyclic antidepressants and congenital prolonged QT syndrome. Next is a 62-year-old man with renal failure and complaints of dyspnea and orthopnea after missing last two hemodialysis sessions. What is the obvious finding? It's a tall peak P waves. So this ECG shows not only a tall peak P wave, but I can see there's a prolongation of PR interval and also non-specific interventricular conduction delay, slight broadening of the QRS complexes with tall peak T waves. So peak T waves are the earliest finding in hyperkalemia. And as the potassium will rise, the other ECG abnormalities will develop including P wave flattening, PR interval and QRS prolongations and high degree AV blocks. But you have to differentiate the tall uh, T waves from the other causes. And how do you do that? Like in acute myocardial ischemia or in pericarditis, you can get tall T waves. But here it will be much broader and asymmetric. But for in hyperkalemia, it will be narrow and peaked. So with that, it completes our session. Thank you very much for your patient listening. Uh, thank you, Gaurav, for a very, very comprehensive uh, review on ECG. I think you couldn't have got a more comprehensive description about the fundamental philosophy, uh, the physiology behind the ECG, the, the description of a normal ECG, how to interpret an ECG, the various bradyarrhythmias, the tachyarrhythmias, then the ECG changes that, are hap that happen with certain clinical scenarios metabolic scenarios. Uh, so we'll be good to take questions. Uh, I don't see anything that has come in as well, uh, as yet. But uh, this is uh, what I can only tell you is I know it will be difficult for you to remember everything that Gaurav has said. It is like a classic textbook uh, kind of a talk on ECG. But uh, uh, what I would uh, ask you is, if in case you are in, you want a, you want clarification or anything, uh, you can go back and go through this presentation yet again. It will be available maybe within a day's time or a, maybe after 48 hours at the HCP forum website, and uh, you can uh, uh, go through this again. You can post your queries or comments over there. Yeah, I, I would agree with what Srimuntika says over here that uh, it, you can't get a more comprehensive and more crystal clear presentation on ECG. And that's why I asked Gaurav to do this. Thank you. Uh, Gaurav, there is a small, there is a question. Uh, when do you call a T wave as a tall T wave? What should be the height of the T wave? To call it as a tall T wave. See, usually uh, tall T waves are more than two millimeters in the uh, precordial leads, but uh, isolated T waves uh, are less, except for hyperkalemia. They are usually associated with other causes like uh, cases of early repolarization syndrome or in case of uh, left bundle branch block. Uh, so uh, the main differentiating point with uh, when the T, uh, tall T are associated with an ST elevation or with the early repolarization syndrome, there uh, what you have to see is that in case of early repolarization syndrome, the T wave will be four times than the ST elevation, uh, which which will uh, think that it is not basically a myocardial infarction but an early repolarization syndrome. Uh, 
and if you get a, a specific uh, only t wave abnormality which you get in uh, case of uh, hyperkalemia i think uh, it should be more than minimum 2 to 3 mm but usually you don't get you get associated with a st elevation so you have to you have to differentiate between a myocardial infarction and early repolarization syndrome with the uh, balance of the st and the t the difference in in uh, in case of myocardial infarction the t will be much shorter in relation to the st but in case of early repolarization the t will be four times than the st thank you dr gorav for the wonderful presentation and thank you for the audience uh, for a lovely audience and uh, thank you for all the queries we'll like to uh, have you in future also for our future webinars and you will get a mail from us for the feedback and the certification thing so please reply to the feedback and you will get the certificate accordingly thank you thank you everybody